Please be seated. I come before you today as a frustrated minister and proclaimer of good news because there's so much in today's passage that when I was practicing it this morning, no matter how many times I edited it, it came out 45 to 50 minutes long. <laughs> I know you all love me and you appreciate me, but I know there's a limit as well. So I had to do some major editing, but I will hit the highlights, I promise you. All right, so hear this word from the Gospel of Matthew as it's a continuation of the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister is something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. Go first and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will not, be, you will not get out until you have paid every last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your eye has caused you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. It almost sounds like Matthew's a Baptist here, doesn't it? <laughs> and if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said, whew, that's not enough. <clears throat> anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her a victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, I, you have heard it was said to people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven or for God, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot even for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All of you need to say a simple yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. All right, so there you go. Wasn't that special? Now you can see my dilemma, because I know this is speaking to everybody here, and there's a lot to say. Okay, so first of all, let's do this. Matthew is speaking to a Jewish audience because Matthew is a Jew himself. So a Jewish writer speaking to a Jewish audience. And what he's doing here is he's sharing something to his Jewish audience which is very familiar with them. Parts of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not what? Kill? Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not take God's name in vain by swearing on the oath of God. And thou shalt not commit adultery. So, some of the basic laws. All right? Now, the Gospel of Matthew was written sometime around 80 to 90 CE. So, we're looking at 50 to 60 years after the Jesus event. That's significant. How many of you were alive during the Civil Rights Movement in the, in the 60s? All right, yeah, 1964, I was seven years old. So you look at that history. How many of you recall how things were written about Martin Luther King Jr. and the Civil Rights Movement in the 60s as compared to how it's written about today? Yeah. 
How many of you think there would be a monument for Martin Luther King Jr. in Washington, D.C. in the 70s or the 80s or the 90s? How long did it take to get it there? Too long. How long? There you go. You see. So history has a way of interpreting events and then recording things differently. So you're looking at Matthew talking to a group of people trying to convince them that Jesus is the Messiah. Why is Matthew focusing so much on the law? Well, in the Jewish tradition, the law is everything. It's at the core of who they are as a people, the religious tradition, the Torah. Jesus was crucified and sacrificed because the religious leaders said that he was a what? Blasphemer and one who broke the law that justified it. So this many years later, in order to convince his people that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, he needs to talk about the law. And if you remember from last week, it says that Jesus did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, to, com- to fulfill every letter of it, right? So this is a continuation of that. So we have a set of laws. So I want to go quickly through some of them because I found that when I went through all of them completely, it took way too much time. All right, let's look at the swearing part. I swear to God, you can trust me. I swear to God, I swear on my parents. I swear on my children. I swear to God. If someone has got to swear that much that you can trust them, it's probably a good sign that you, you should what? Not trust them. Because if they've got to work that hard to convince you, chances are, you you, you know what I'm saying? I saw a wonderful documentary on Warren Buffett. I keep wanting to say Beatty, two very different guys. (laughs) Warren Buffett, what a strange bird he is. But what a wonderful character to study. And the, and the documentary has him in front of what looks either to be a senior high school or maybe a college class. And he's talking about his life and investment and leadership and all kinds of things. And toward the end of the documentary, he's talking about reputation. One's reputation, he says, you spend your lifetime building your reputation and you can lose it in one day. Now, throughout his career, he spent most of it in the town where he grew up. He stayed away from Wall Street and all that because he thought they were crooks. He didn't like the way they did business. He invested for the people who gave him. He invested for his clients, not for the sake of his own company. So that was kind of his, his ethics in doing business. But later in his career, he bought a big share of Solomon Brothers on Wall Street probably should have stuck with his original plan because one of the investors at Solomon Brothers went rogue and did some very unethical, illegal things. Word got out, and the Treasury, Treasury, Secretary of Treasury came down hard on the Solomon Brothers and would not allow them to trade. It's kind of bad for business, isn't it? Solomon Brothers' stocks went from here to... Warren Buffett called him and said, you know, hey, we had no idea. This is not a part of our culture. We don't condone this. What can we do to make this right? And the Treasury Secretary said, expect anything. He said, oh, that was not what he wanted to hear. Eventually, there were Senate hearings. The board of directors decided to make him the chairman and he would represent Solomon Brothers. Because, see, and this is Warren Buffett. He said, we employed 8,000 people. He says, and all of them weren't shady characters and unethical. He said, I didn't want 8,000 people out on, he said, this wasn't going to affect my life at all. So at the hearing, he read a statement, and I'm paraphrasing. He said, as the chairman of Solomon Brothers, I take full responsibility. Boom, right there, you know he's an, a leader, right? I take full responsibility of the unethical activity that took place. And here is a memo that I sent to all of our employees. You will always act and trade in an ethical and legal manner. In doing so, if you lose money, we will forgive you. 
If you act and trade in an illegal and unethical manner, you will experience the full measure of my wrath. The Senate, the United States Treasury, allowed them to start trading again. He says the reason they did that was not based upon the fact that they thought we were Solomon brothers would be good, you know, and turn it around. They said, he said, the reason they did that is because of my what? Reputation. They trusted him. See? If you're a person of honor and a tr person of trust, you don't have to go around swearing to God, swearing to your children, swearing on your mama's grave. You don't have to go around trying to, tr to, to convince people to believe you and to trust you. A simple yes and a simple no is all you need. Is it? So, that's out of the way. All right. The whole adultery thing. Remember Jimmy Carter? Bless his heart. Those of you from the South know exactly what I mean by that, right? Remember during the campaign? Had he had any affairs or had he... Well, I did lust once. I did look at a playboy. Oh my God, that is so innocent compared to where we are today, right? <laughs> so, in a very legal sense, in a very literal sense, you can say, I have never cheated on my wife or my husband. I've never committed adultery. But what Jesus is doing in this is he's challenging to take it further. Mm, if you lust upon someone and it goes a little too long, then you've committed the act. Now, we're human beings, right? No matter how much you love your spouse, you see someone who's really good looking, you say, oh, wow, she's really pretty, or wow, he's really handsome. That's a normal thing. But if it goes a little too far, and as we say in the South, if it starts to linger, <laughs> you know what I mean? The, the real pronunciation is linger, but it starts to linger, you start to really start to think about it maybe a little too much, then you've crossed that boundary. Then Jesus starts using a little hyperbole, right? It's better to gouge out your eye if it causes you to stumble than to spend your life in hell. It's better to cut off your right hand if it causes you to stumble. Now, why he wanted you to cut off his right hand, I don't know, but anyway, he used it in the uh, illustration. So, we know from that that people who claim that they interpret the Bible literally, we know that they don't interpret that part literally, right? But what Jesus is doing is he's challenging people, don't go around talking about how righteous you are. Because God's standards are much higher as far as being spiritual beings than what a legal religious code is all about. All right, so... What were the other ones? Okay, the other one is about the divorce. Now, that's a confusing one. And this passage has been used to create a lot of pain, guilt, and suffering for a lot of people. And it has been used out of context. When Jesus addressed it in this passage, he was doing so as a social justice issue. All right? In the first century, a man, and only a man, could write a certificate of divorce to his wife for any reason whatsoever. If she burned the lamb on a particular Sabbath, he could write her a certificate of divorce. For any reason whatsoever, a man could divorce his wife. If he lived with her for seven year, several years, they had children together, but he saw somebody else who caught his eye, and he decided, I want to live with her and be married to her, he could write a certificate of divorce and be done with it. It was that easy. Now, why was this a social injustice? Because it was a patriarchal society, and men had control. A woman was dependent upon a man to provide for her and her family. So for a man to just write a certificate of divorce for a woman, he was casting her out in the street, and thus she becomes very vulnerable. And then the law continues on that if you marry a divorced woman, then you too are committing adultery. So if you're taking it very literally, then there's no chance she's ever going to have another relationship, right? 
So Jesus is taking this in a sense of social justice. We, on the other hand, have taken it, something from a Middle Eastern culture in the first century that was written in Greek, translated it into English, and then interpreted in a Western culture mindset. Went to seminary with a fellow. He was married before he came to seminary, Baptist seminary. Was married about three or four years after he was married. He was a high school uh, music teacher. He came home from work and found an envelope on the mantel from his wife saying, I've fallen in love with someone else. I'm divorcing you. Boom, done. When he came to seminary, he was a single divorced man. While in seminary, he did what a lot of us did. He found a job, and he was a part-time music minister at a church in Durham, North Carolina. And so classic, one of the ladies in the choir was pretty and was single, had never been married. They fell in love. They got married because he married her, and now he's married twice. In the Southern Baptist tradition, he could not be ordained. For him to marry this woman after he'd been divorced, now he's living in an adulterous relationship, which really wasn't taken literally because it talks about if you marry the one, you know, anyway. But, so he had to change denominations in order to serve out his calling. Right. Now, a second story. Many years ago, I had a woman come to me and she says, I want to know if you will marry me and my husband. I said, well, sure. What would stop me? And she started telling me her story. She had grown up as a devout Catholic. I mean, devout. She loved the church. Loved the church. She had been in a marriage with an alcoholic man who was physically abusive. They had children together. She had gone to her priest about the abuse, and the priest told her, well, God's law says, and God's teaching says, you must be submissive to your husband. And God wants you to stay in this, message, in this marriage. That is the godly thing to do. So she did. Until one day, he beat her almost to death. She was hospitalized. That same priest came to see her in the hospital and prayed for her healing while in the hospital. And she was determined that she was not going to allow him to kill her and then orphan her children because she knew he would not care for her children. So she divorced him. Years later, she fell in love with a man who was kind and nurturing and just, he, he was a beautiful soul. He loved her children, they loved him, and she went to her priest to get married. And guess what he said? No, based upon that passage, for me to do a wedding for you and this man would be for me to condone you to living in adultery. But she, you know my story, she said. How can this be? That he, my, my former husband was abusive. and he, I'm sorry. The church cannot condone this wedding. The only thing that you could do was get an annulment. She said, what is that? Well, that's for the church to sanction your former marriage and say that it never existed. She said, but we were married for over 10 years and we have children. Of course it existed. Well, an annulment would allow you to marry this man and the church could condone it. Well, what do I need to get an annulment? $10,000 donation to the church. And that's when she came to me. Now, those of you who've known me for 20, almost 22 years know I've been married more than once. The one that I'm in now more than makes up for the 24 years of misery that I had before. They may be saying the same thing about me. I don't know. I don't care. But I do know this. I do not believe for one second God would want me to live like I was living for so long and miss out on where I am today. I don't. And if God is that much of a stickler about people entering into healthy, loving relationships, even though they've been divorced, then I would gladly go to hell with that woman and anybody else who's had the courage to leave unhealthy marriages 
Probably, a, I would rather be in hell with her than with all the Pharisees if they're the ones who make it to heaven. But that's easy for me to say because I don't believe that that's going to happen. But this is a case in point where we sometimes take the scriptures and we use them in a way that are not there to support people and to help people, but we use them as a weapon against them at times when they're most vulnerable. And I think that is the sin. That's the sin. All right. Whew. Well, here comes the last part. Jesus says, you've heard it said that you should not murder. Killing is bad. We are in a civilized country, say you shouldn't murder. You get punished for murdering, right? Killing is bad. But killing is bad unless you're in self-defense. Killing is bad unless you're an act of war. So there are loopholes. But we, Jesus says, you've heard it said that you should not murder or kill. But I tell you that if you look upon one of your brothers and sisters with hatred in your heart, then in the eyes of God you've done so already. So you can claim to be a very righteous person and say, I've never committed adultery. I've never murdered. I've never na taken the Lord's name in vain. In a very little sense, that may be true. But you may have lusted and you may have hated. And you may go around swearing on your righteousness, right? Jesus is challenging the strict legalism and showing people that as a spiritual being, it goes beyond obeying a very strict set of rules. Then he goes on to talk about calling your brother raka or calling your brother or sister fool. Now, if I call you a fool, you're such a fool. In our culture, what does that mean? You're silly. You're acting like an idiot, right? That was kind of stupid. You're such a fool. He's so foolish. It could mean a lot of it. It's kind of like the word interesting, right? That was interesting. Well, was it? Mentally stimulating, or it was really weird. You fool. No, it means something very different in the Greek. Raka, fool. When you call someone this in the first century, in this context, in the Greek, it means you're discounting their humanity. That's what it means. You see? And if you can discount someone's humanity, then that justifies you to do what? What? If they're no longer human in your mind, you can do what? Kill them. There you go. Boom! Kill them. They deserved it. They're an animal. Right? Those who fought civil rights know all about that, don't you? Yeah. That's why you fought. Because those in power deemed whole classes of people something less than human. And you could hang them, shoot them, kill them, do whatever you wanted to them because somehow, without trial, without due process, because somehow, they're less than human. LGBT community, you know that, don't you? It's still going on, right? It's still going on even with our African-American friends. It's going on with it. Still, if a groups of people who have the power deem certain groups of people, raka, fools, less than human, somehow it justifies their doing inhumane acts to them. And that's what Jesus warns. Okay, so... Let's take a look at this even deeper. And my introduction on looking deeper, I'm going to do with this. A story that some of you have heard before, and some of you may not, but it's one of my favorite stories. Two rabbis, old rabbis, were sitting and talking, and they were just exploring the idea of heaven together. And one rabbi says to the other, how long do you think it will take when we're in heaven 
to know the full and complete meaning of every word in Torah, every jot and tittle in Torah, every single mark in Torah. How long do you think it will take us? The other rabbi stroked his beard and he thought for a moment. He says, I think, I think it will take about a thousand years. The other rabbi responded in great distress, a thousand years? And after a thousand years, then what will we do? The old rabbi stroked his beard and he says, then we'll start discovering the meanings of all the spaces between the marks. And that, my friend, will take us in eternity. And I see my job for you is to help you to see the spaces between the sentences, the spaces between the words, the spaces between the letters. I think this is why Jesus taught in parables and used hyperbole. If you and I can resolve the whole murder and hatred and raka thing in our lives, the other stuff takes care of itself. He talks in there too about going to court and settling it before you get there. He's not giving legal advice there. We'll get to that in a second. Most of the time, when people do acts of violence to individuals or to groups of people. What they are doing is projecting what they hate most about themselves onto that individual or onto those groups of people. I've seen in the news where there was a legislator who went about doing this big crusade about all people who receive public assistance must have drug testing only to find out that he himself was arrested recently for cocaine. Projection. Perfect example. Years ago, we had a state legislator who went on this big anti-pornography campaign, going to close down all the adult clubs, going to this big campaign, adult bookstores, just going to make us morally straight and pure, only to be videotaped, putting dollar bills on a dancer at a nightclub G-string, right? Projection. We had a national legislator on a big LGBT, uh, LBGTQ campaign. No tolerance, no rights, nothing. We must be strict against the, they, are, they are not right, they are sick, they cannot be normal. This big campaign only to discover he was discovered on a consistent basis having sex with men anonymously in airport bathrooms. Those are classic examples of projection. Something that I hate about myself, and rather than dealing with it within myself, I will put myself into a position where I try to deal with it vicariously by trying to solve it with everyone else around me. All right, now those examples may be a little extreme for you, but I'm going to bring it closer to home. I'm still talking too long, but I think I've got you for a few more minutes. How many here, you don't have to, just, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many here find it much easier to see the problems in others than in yourself? How many of you here find it much easier to resolve the problems of others than to resolve the problems within yourself? Bingo. So this is why Jesus talks about if you go to the altar and you're offering God a gift at the altar and there's a relationship that's not been reconciled, don't go to the altar. Oh God, oh God, take my offering. I'm so sorry all these bad things are happening. God, I hope that you will just work it out. And God's not codependent. God's not going to just work it out for you. Uh-uh. Nope. Saw on Facebook the other day about a parent who found out his little boy had taken something from the Walmart. He says, where'd you get that? He was kind of grinning. He said, come on, let's go back inside. Eyes like saucers. 
The little boy went back to the place where he grabbed it. Uh-uh, no, you need to give it to that lady. Immediately he felt shame. Nope, you give it back to that lady. You, told her, you tell her what you did. Shame. He started to cry. He gave it to her and said he was sorry. All right? You see? Now, an unhealthy daddy would have made excuses for it or let him slide. No, you see, God will not let you slide. If you've got an issue with someone, you go resolve it. And just know that God will give you the resources to help you to do the job. You've got to do your part. They may accept it. They may not accept it. Reconciliation may take place. It may not take place. The bottom line is, is you made the effort. But it goes further than that. Because most of the time, when we come before the altar of God, we're thinking about what other people are doing and not doing, rather than what? See, that's the spaces between the letters. What Jesus is doing in this passage is saying, rather than going to court and settle something, while you're along the way, resolve it. No, resolve what you have going on within your own psyche. Psyche, Greek word for soul. Resolve what's going on within your own psyche. Resolve it. Take care of it. Heal it. Rather than going to the altar of God and praying somehow God's going to resolve all the problems with all the people you have. No, you find out how you resolve the problem within yourself. I mentioned earlier how I'm in a very happy, loving, beautiful marriage with Amy and I have a wonderful daughter. That's a gift. You know why I have that? It's because I had to spend months figuring out what am I doing to keep screwing up my life? I had to do that. Or else I was going to step into another one. And believe me, I had opportunities to do so. That's what, that's what this passage is saying, you see. And when we find it, we have peace within our own spirit. When we're reconciled to ourselves, then it decreases significantly our desire to hate other people. Does that make sense? Because most of my hatred toward others is not really what they've done. It's what I have feelings toward myself. So if I am feeling like I'm a rather dishonest person, I'm going to hate anybody that I think is stealing. If I have a hard time telling the truth, I'm just going to have no tolerance for anybody who lies. No. Throw the book out of the rest. When we have peace within ourselves, we can reconcile our own spirit with God then that increases our capacity to be forgiving. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, we must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive. He who is devoid of the power to forgive is devoid of the power to love. There is some good in the worst of us and some evil in the best of us. When we discover this, we are less prone to hate our enemies. Thou shalt not kill. Stop killing yourself. What do you talk, how how do you speak to yourself? How many of you have children? How many of you have grandchildren? How many of you have nieces and nephews that you adore? How many of you have pets? How many of you would tolerate for one second for other people to talk to your children, your nieces, your nephews, and your, te- your, your pets in the way that you talk to yourself? Stop it. Reconcile. Reconcile that safe, that self-hatred. Because that self-hatred is being projected and doing all kinds of damage in the world around you. Promise you. 
And if you have enough money and enough power, you can do worldwide damage with them. As people in Germany in the 1930s, people in the Soviet Union, Native Americans who lived through Andrew Jackson. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said what? Love the Lord your God with all of your strength in your mind, in your heart, in your soul, and with all your might. And the second is likened to it. Love your neighbor as, finish it for me. Say it louder. I say this with me. I love my neighbor as I love myself. That ends the lesson. Let us pray. God, the greatest violence that's in our world, I believe, is the, stems from the violence we do within our minds, the things that we say to ourselves, the things that we do to ourselves, the things that we refuse to acknowledge within us, and how we take it out upon those around us. We need healing. Every soul here needs healing. Every soul here needs to take that inward journey. Every soul here needs to go find those dark places and those shadows where we've suppressed the truth about ourselves so deeply we don't even know what's there anymore. It's kind of like when we're moving from one place to the next. We find the deep corner of our house and we say, I didn't know I had that in it. I had no idea I had that. Yeah, it's that God. And God, I want them, every soul that is here to know that you're not codependent and you're not going to just take that away. But you are loving and you are empowering and you will empower every soul here and give them the resources to explore and to find healing from every negative self-talk and every negative, hurtful, murderous thing that we say to ourselves. Those who need counseling, seek it, get it. Those who need Stephen's ministers, we've got them here, use them. Those who are carrying painful secrets of guilt and shame, come see me. Tell them. God, pester them till they can't sleep at night to come see their pastor who will not judge them, but celebrate and honor them for their courage. Because I've had my secrets too, and I've shared them. God, it's time that we start getting real we start becoming whole and complete as children created in your image. I'm distressed about the hatred we have in our country. And unless there is healing, each side at some point is going to start calling the other raka and fool. And at some point, we're going to justify killing the other. And then we'll be at a point of no return. So God, I am tempted to say, oh God, I pray for those out there. But I'm doing myself in this congregation a disservice. No God, I pray for me. 
and how I feel about the other side. And I pray for those who are here who disagree with me and how they feel toward my side. And I pray for all of us here that as we seek justice, we do so in a way that is compassionate and healing. Regardless of what side we're on. We're all your children. And not only children in this country, but we're all your children across this world. So help us to be mindful that when we feel extreme anger and hatred toward a person or classes of people, may the words that I've shared this morning strike the hearts and the minds of everyone here to stop, reflect, and say, hmm, how is that mirroring how I feel about myself? And before we try to impose or project justice upon the world, may we find peace and justice within our souls, and then we'll have a greater capacity for tolerance, for kindness, compassion. So I pray for myself. I pray for every soul here. That we fulfill our passions, we fulfill our calling but we do so with compassion and with building up rather than destroying. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.